well known about our new surgical robot that we've launched in various parts of the world. We're going to be starting our U.S. Uh, clinical trial here very soon. You know, a very uh, interesting, um, uh, you know, renal denervation technology for, for hypertension. You know, even the data that's public, you know, there'll be more data coming out here shortly. Even the data that's public I, I, is very compelling. We know this, is, this works. We know it's durable and we know that patients prefer it. Uh, so an exciting opportunity there. And our biggest growth driver over the next five years is that structural heart space, catheter-based uh, valves, uh, whether it be aortic and over, over time here, um, mitral and tricuspid, huge. What we did on to patients <laughs> there, the advancements is amazing. And from a financial standpoint, big growth markets for us. One of the ones that I think is really an under, um, underappreciated area for Medtronic is our ablation business going forward. We have a nice uh, therapeutic business. There's some new therapies coming in that are um, safer, easier to use, you know, PFA for those that follow it. And now we've got a new mapping and navigation system. So we're building that ecosystem with, for AFib for uh, physicians, really excited there. Then of course, our, our diabetes business that has very exciting technology. We just need to work through, uh, get this technology in the US as we work through our, our warning letter there. You know, one area I've been talking about a lot over the last two days is ecosystems. So it's not just about our products, it's about how our products, technologies come together. Again, very focused on specific needs. This example here is in spine surgery. We've been building out this ecosystem for well over 20 years uh, and, and invested quite a bit over the last 10 in particular. Uh, and it's really changing spine surgery from you know, basically an art to a science. And it is it's minimizing and over time, you know, I think uh, you know, significantly reducing the variation in spine surgery. And just as you go around that wheel, you know, we've got AI-based surgical planning systems for uh, you know, preoperative planning that takes the images from uh, the patient diagnosis piece uh, to build a personalized plan uh, on a very complicated uh, surgical area. Then we have a, that feeds that personalized plan, the AI-based plan feeds a surgical ecosystem here of imaging, navigation, robotics to make sure that the plan is executed precisely. Uh, and then, you, you know, in follow-up, all the, we follow these patients with more images and that feeds back into our uh, AI-based plan. And that every patient that goes through this, we get smarter and smarter. Um, and then finally, uh, with our touch surgery platform, you know, we're able, we're video, videoing, you know, these surgical procedures and using this, uh, you know, to, to, for surgeon training. And over time, this will be real-time training as they step out uh, of, the, of, the sur of the surgery will be on their phone. They can see an annotated uh, breakdown of the surgery and how they did. So very exciting here. And then look, taking this technology uh, and, and bringing it to emerging markets has been for the last you know, 50, you know, 50, 12, 15 years from Medtronic, this has been almost like an independent growth vector, uh, emerging market growth growing uh, well into the double digits. Um, and if you think about it, what we've done over the last uh, 15 years is we've gone from a, think about a, a sales and marketing organization into these emerging markets. And over the last 10 years, we've added on top of that sales and marketing market access. Uh, and now we're localizing, localizing our innovation capabilities that largely rest in the United States and a little bit in Israel, localizing that in different emerging markets around the world and really customizing this technology a little bit to, you know, it's less about the, the uh, you know, the patient makeup, it's more about the eco, the healthcare systems in these countries where they tend to be less resources and a lot higher volume and a lot less room for cost than you see in the Western world. Uh, and that's where the, that's where we are headed. Uh, and, and it's an evolution <laughs> of our emerging market strategy, sales and marketing 15 years ago, last 10 add on to that market access capabilities, market development capabilities, and now localization of our uh, innovation machine. And then finally, data in the eye. Look, it, it, I mentioned it before, it's, it's really an inflection point for, for the industry, you know, because we're learning so much through the proliferation of data and the ability to, you know, to analyze it using AI and other tools. Uh, this is an example of a pill cam. People joke around, I have one in my pocket all the time, so I really do. Uh, I carry it around. This one has not been used yet. Uh, and, you know, this pill you swallow, it's an imaging device, beams the images into your phone. You can't see them on the phone. It goes, it's just a communication device into the cloud where we do the colonoscopy. We're doing this right now in the UK for NHS. Uh, you know, once that, you know, that colonoscopy is done in the cloud, you know, seven out of 10 people don't need to go in for a traditional colonoscopy. So it frees up all kinds of uh, uh, capacity and re reduces costs. Uh, and, and, um, 
you know, but the point is three out of three out of 10 people do need to go get a colonoscopy. So get your colonoscopy uh, one way or the other. And, th and, and this isn't on the market yet in the US, but the algorithm is. And what we're finding in for traditional colonoscopies, we're doing putting the AI in the traditional colonoscopy tower for in the United States. And we're finding that we're finding a lot more abnormalities, more polyps that were physicians were missing. Uh, and so you can see the power of this. It's, it's generating, it's making things easier for the clinicians. It's freeing up capacity. It's improving pa patient outcomes. It's, a, you know, AI here, it's the triple aim. You're getting better outcomes. You're getting more access and you're reducing costs all at the same time. So that's the power of the technology. And this is just one example. Now I want to switch to uh, operational, uh, you know, our operating model, which we've talked about culture and incentives. Talk a little bit about that. So we talked quite a bit about our operating model. We used to have post our COVID emerging, we had a pretty big built out matrix. We've significantly streamlined that over the last two years, um, getting down to these 20 operating units uh, that are very focused on specific therapies. These are global operating units, global businesses, very focused on a, a, a defined set of conditions, backing up to a defined set of physicians and, and, and uh, technologies. Uh, and like I said, there's 20 arranged how I, I talked about earlier. This model has really helped us to one, you know, in, in med tech, the innovation model um, focus <laughs> has really led to uh, more speed uh, and better innovation, we think, more consistent innovation. So that's, that's why we've gone to this model. But at the same time, uh, you know, we're learning better to leverage our scale. Uh, so we call it playing small and playing big at the same time. We talk about leveraging our scale. We're really focused on three areas because leveraging your skills, it sounds good in meetings like this and in conference rooms, but leveraging your skills is hard to do and you need to be very focused. And we're focused on three areas. Customers, especially as our customers are, are hospital customers. The physician customers are handled by the 20 operating units, but the hospitals themselves that are getting bigger and bigger and some of them are going global. Uh, that is uh, by our enterprise account team. So we're focusing on leveraging our scale to do more partnerships with these, these large health systems. That's one, two, technology platforms. Think about it, robotics, that cuts across. We have three robots in the market today, uh, our soft tissue robot, our spine robot, our cranial robot, and there'll be more to come. So building out robotics platforms that can be customized to various different carriers. Think about uh, implantable electronics. We got them for neuro, deep brain stimulation, pain stimulation, overactive bladder, pacing, ICDs for, you know, uh, you know, so you, know, you, you see the point. So how do you get these hardware platforms are similar? So that's another tech platform, microelectronics, biomaterials. So we've set up these technology development centers. And the third area is one that's a hot topic today, which I'll get into is supply chain. We made a huge, this is an area, there's a huge opportunity for healthcare. Uh, this, is not, this is an area we can definitely learn from, from outside the industry. And that's exactly what we're doing. We brought in our leader from uh, a new supply chain leader uh, a little over a year and a half ago, I guess, uh, from Walmart. Also, he's got experience in the automotive and the, and the food industry. Brought in a, a lot of new people underneath him with different capabilities from outside of healthcare, outside of medtech, outside of Medtronic. Uh, and, and we're investing in system. We've centralized the group, again, to leverage our scale. Uh, not, not these 20 operating units all can't be experts in, in supply chain, especially now supply chain has become much more complicated uh, and, 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 and definitely favors the, the larger companies, the scale. You got to leverage your scale here. Uh, we're, we're focusing on specific supplier relationships, fewer suppliers, more partnerships with suppliers, investing in systems uh, across the company. We're going to turn this into a, this is not a strength for MedTech, it's not a strength for us, uh, but we're transforming this into a strength. And it's something that's going to bleed into our hospital relationships as well, in terms of working with them on supply chain to take out costs out of the industry. So there's an example of us, you know, really investing and learning how to use our scale. Um, now shifting to culture. I talked about our mission-driven cult culture, but we also want to be an and company, mission-driven and performance-driven. So uh, in 2020, we, we put a lot of time in with our leadership to come up with these, uh, what we call the Medtronic mindset, which you can see is largely based about execution and performance, being bold, acting with speed and decisiveness, et cetera, et cetera. And I was nervous of how a mission-driven company would react to this. You got to be both mission-driven and performance, but I've been pleasant. I've been very pleased with the energy around this inside the company and out. Uh, you see it in our employee per, you know, survey scores. Uh, and you know, <clears throat> even though it's a chaotic environment, we're, we're good with you know, kind of the retention that we're having here. Uh, and it's being recognized outside the company. Most recently, Fortune Magazine's uh, you know, world best, uh, World's Best Workplaces uh, we were number 12 this year. Uh, this just came out maybe two or three weeks ago, or maybe not even that long ago. You know, there's still 11 places above us, 
So uh, there's room for improvement, but 12 is pretty good. Uh, it's the highest we've been. So it's good to see this uh, recognized outside the company. Uh, now shifting to compensation systems to support this performance and to support this performance-driven culture and hold us accountable. I'll get into comp. What you see here on the left is, is, is my comp and on the right, you see uh, the makeup of uh, our top executives. I think the moral, I'm not gonna go through each and every number here, but the moral of the story is it's, 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 it's highly variable. Uh, it's, and it's very much uh, tied to performance. Um, and, and so I just wanna make sure that's, that's clear. You can see the makeup here uh, and I'll get into uh, our bonus plans here in a second. Uh, this next page gets into our bonus plan structure. The top of the page is what we used to have. The bottom is what we transitioned to a little over uh, a year ago. Uh, and you can see the big difference here is we added, you know, it's still based, uh, this is our annual bonus for my leadership team. And this basic structure filters down throughout the company and covers roughly over 60,000 people in a company, this annual bonus plan, this basic structure. Uh, you see one fourth based on revenue growth, one fourth based on EPS or, you know, operating profit if you're, you know, one fourth based on cash flow, which has been, you know, a big focus of ours. And a, and a real strength of the last couple of years, uh, and then uh, market share. So to make sure that our uh, you know compensation is not just based on how you did against your plan, but those plans are market based. We've been adding more uh, ESG related uh, metrics too. We've had quality for a number of years, and we've added uh, ID and E, which I'll get to in a little bit. Exactly what's in there uh, as a uh, a qualifier, uh, if you will, to our our, our team performance. And then finally, you have your individual performance. And we've taken Medtronic's annual bonus plan from a, what I'd say was historically more of a profit sharing to a very much a performance-based plan. Our overall company performance dictates how big the pool is. I just went through the performance metrics. And then, and then your team, your slice of that pie and one of those 20 OUs is dependent on how you did on these metrics. And then you individually uh, based on your own individual metrics. Uh, that's our annual bonus, our long-term comp, big changes there as well. Uh, the, the from was on the left, the two was on the right. The summary is we've, uh, you can see on the, on the left there, we had some cash component in our long-term comp. We've moved that cash out, it's all equity. You can see that 50% slice, that orange pie there, that's uh, you know, focused mainly on performance share. So 50% is performance share units uh, and the remaining 50 is a mix between RSUs and stock options. The performance criteria for the long-term comp is the bottom left there, 50% on revenue growth. That, that revenue growth drives our long-term uh, you know, shareholder formula here, which I'll get to at the end of the presentation. It's got to hit that, that, that revenue growth and it filters down from there. And then uh, the other you know, 50% is uh, tied to uh, total uh, shareholder return for a, a defined uh, peer set. And then finally, uh, you know, we have this at an ROIC, return on invested capital qualifiers. You do all this at a certain ROIC number uh, or above. Now, shifting to uh, ESG uh, and the key elements of our ESG program, I am going to you know, start with governance. And governance starts with our board of directors. And you know, again, these slides are, will be available on our website. I'm not gonna drain each and every uh, slide here, but I do wanna pull out a couple of key points here. One uh, is the engagement of our board. Our board is very engaged, uh, not just with me, but my direct reports and even further down in the organization and even with our, with our customers. So just an example, just uh, we had a board meeting two weeks ago uh, where the board got to uh, meet with obviously the senior management team, but also uh, we, our new soft tissue robot that we, I mentioned earlier, uh, they got to see that uh, the latest version of that system uh, and, and understand how it works and talk to the team and interface with the team that owns that system within Medtronic but also met with a number of surgeons that are using it uh, and training other physicians. So they get a clear bit of what, what, what is a pro, what, what are we up against, what are the cons, what are the opportunities to fix things and improve things, what's working. Uh, so you get, just to give you that example, because it's recent and it gives you an example of the, the engagement and the depth. We can't do that with all of our products, but these are the bigger ones, the bigger growth opportunities. Uh, in terms of expanding our markets, getting to more patients and driving our financials. The other thing I'd point out is we added a fifth meeting. We had four meetings a year. We've added a fifth. It's strictly strategy because as I've talked about, a big uh, part of our strategy is more in this operating model, decisive capital allocation amongst the, the 20 businesses and then portfolio. Uh, you know, what businesses should be in our portfolio and, 
and whatnot and why and where are the synergies. And, and so a lot more time on that. We added a fifth board meeting. We talk about it every board meeting, but we added a fifth just to get into uh, strategies um, uh, and, and, and nothing else. Now, getting into the makeup of the board, it's, it's largely independent. You see that there's 10 independent directors plus myself. Um, we've got, you know, I'll just, the key theme here is diversity. Diversity of, you know, board tenure, you know, diversity of age, at least in a relative band, at least. Um, and, and a lot of, you know, gender and ethnic diversity, which we've improved over the last couple of years. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the diversity of the board because what we're really looking for is diversity of experiences, diversity of thought, uh, personalities that really, I think, drive proper governance uh, and serve uh, as real, um, to me, you know, real um, you know, mentors and, 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 and advisors uh, to me and the management team and also provide good governance uh, for, for other stakeholders. And then again, in, in, in I talked about diversity, all these other, here's another element of diversity is skill sets and domain expertise. We laid out this year, we refreshed on the Y axis, these eight areas of uh, domain expertise that we think are important. And then we self-evaluated ourselves and we rated each other on, on these elements and then plotted this out. To, and we're gonna, we continue to look at this to make sure that we believe we're well represented across these, these eight areas. Uh, these, are, these are the critical skills that we uh, think a board uh, should have. And then um, I wanna get into, you know, a little bit more into ESG here. Uh, in the next couple slides, uh, we just in a, you know put out our integrated report here a couple weeks ago, and I think one thing that's important around ESG, I've seen obviously it's a, there's a lot of conversations around this lately, on the last couple of years, and you see companies on a on a spectrum. I think there's less on the far left that are ignoring it, but there's still some there. You've got some that have taken it on as what I'll call an initiative. As you move across that that continuum, you look at it as a critical business strategy, and you really believe that, uh, and you treat these as such, not something you're doing on the side, but a, you, you're integrated in as a critical business strategy. And where you really want to get to is it's really embedded into the DNA of the, and the culture of the company. And I, and I think we have a unique advantage there because these, when you think about ESG and critical elements of ESG, it really maps back to our mission which I talked about, it's hard to explain how serious we take this mission and how it's driven into our DNA. Uh, and it, it just, it, it, it's constant reminders, constant storytelling, constantly having patience in front of our workforce to remind us the impact of what we do uh, and how serious it is and how serious we need to take this. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's really you know, built into to the company and these ESG metrics line up against it really well. And, and, and where we're heading is that we clearly see this as a critical business strategy, and you'll see that in the progress we made here in the next couple of slides, next couple of minutes of the dialogue. But I do believe that we're heading towards this being part of, of our DNA, and it's part of the reason people come to Medtronic, it's part of the reason people stay at Medtronic is, is, is this. Now, let's get into the critical elements uh, or focus areas of our ESG program, again, we just published our um, uh, integrated report uh, and we actually had a, uh, it's been a while, I, you know, I don't know when the next one is, we, we, it's been like about a year, we had a, a dedicated investor session on these ESG metrics and, uh, and had all the experts around the company that own each one of these metrics um, uh, to talk about the plans and we'll do that again. Um, you know, I'm not gonna get into every one of these. I'll, I'll start though on the far right, this is one, that I, we've been at, I think, the longest uh, in terms of what, what's on this page. My predecessor uh, was ahead of his time on this. And we set um, not only uh, a lot of management time on this and an authentic commitment to you know, diversity uh, and looked at it at that time as a, what I'd say a business strategy, you know, back going back to 2012 when, when you know, Omar first started in 2011 but it's evolved since then. But also back in the 2015 timeframe, we put hard targets out there. Back when that was very uh, controversial. You can't have, that's all you have to have. You need you know, real authentic commitment, you need programming. There's a lot more you need here to drive true inclusion. Uh, but the numbers are leading indicators of inclusion and true diversity and equity. <clears throat> and 
we hit those targets in, in, in our 2020 timeframe that Omar set out in 2015. We upped those targets and, and those targets for uh, female diversity is 45% of women in manager and above. Our overall population is really right at 50%, but 45% uh, manager and above are female and 30% in the US. The female number is a gender number is a global number. Uh, ethnic diversity we're measuring uh, in the US and we're looking at 30% uh, to get it to 30% by our FY26. We're you know, uh, wrapping up our second quarter in FY22 you know, right now. So uh, you know, you've got, uh, we are making progress here where we ended up, I'm sorry, our FY23. We ended up our FY22 on the uh, gender diversity at 42%. So we continue, we are at FY20 at 40, FY22 at 42. We're now in FY23, I'm sorry. And we're, we're heading towards 45%. Uh, for FY26. And then on the, eth on the ethnic diversity, we ended FY20 at 25%, uh, FY22 at 27%, and we feel good about getting to that 30%. So a lot of progress there on those. You know, another area I want to touch base on is that we're pretty good proud on is health inequities. You know, this is a key part of our ESG program. We are a healthcare company. Uh, we've been at this quite a while. Uh, we've got a number of programs. I'm going to double click on this what we call Medtronic Labs, which is something that I'm proud to say started in our strategy group when I was running that, uh, when I first started Medtronic. Uh, it is now an independent uh, organization, an independent social enterprise, we refer to it, that sits under our, our foundation. Uh, it supports over 200 sites around the world. And instead of providing grants for others to do the work, we do the work. Uh, and um, the basic recipe here is focusing on uh, underserved communities around the world. We started in you know, places like on the map here, Philippines, uh, Africa, India, uh, you know, or in other places around the world. And um, the formula basically focuses on, um, it, it focuses on, first of all, a handheld EMR, basically, uh, leveraging cell phone technology uh, to, and, and then the other element of this program is in, empowering frontline healthcare workers. Some of these are people we employ, others we're empowering them uh, and providing them tools. Uh, and because you need these two things, these people don't come to the healthcare system. You've got to go to them. And so you got to be able to track them through basically a handheld EMR. And you need the human healthcare workers that go to them because they're not coming to you. And finally, low cost drugs and devices focused on hypertension, focused on diabetes, and a more, a more niche, but very impactful one is hearing loss. Uh, and so now we sit here, we've, we've been at this for over a decade. It's really hit an inflection point starting in 2016. We've screened 1.2 million people. We've improved the lives through a surgery or a device or a drug of 51,000 people, and we've trained over 3,000 uh, healthcare workers, again, since 2016. And these numbers have really started to ramp in the last couple of years. So particularly proud of this. And now we're bringing this program much, I would never have thought this would be the case, but bringing it to the U.S. Because every healthcare system in this country, large healthcare system has a, in their catchment area, underserved community. Uh, it could be West Louisville or in my backyard, North Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed. Uh, you know, or Camden, New Jersey, and we've, you know, working with virtual health, and we're bringing this program to Camden, and we're in talks with many other, uh, uh, you know, neighborhoods around the country. So I want to end on uh, how we allocate capital uh, and, uh, and, and how we balance that with shareholder returns. Let me start about capital. Look at where the direction of travel for Medtronic, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of opportunity for innovation, and we're putting more into R&D, even during covid we continue to ramp up R&D, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. We feel like it's a very strong return for us and is driving that you know, innovation-driven growth uh, and improving patient outcomes and, and hitting that triple aim. We're also doing that organically, but also inorganically uh, you know, through, through acquisitions. And we're really focused on acquisitions uh, that, uh, that are having an impact uh, and, and, and will show up in our, in our numbers in, in both our patient served numbers as well as our financial numbers. And then finally, innovative programs. We're bringing money from private equity uh, so that we don't have to make um, you know, trade-offs that we don't like uh, on big opportunities. And so it, it, different ways, innovative ways to get more into R&D. So um, that's a big, I'd say a really big focus for our long-term uh, value creation, growth and value creation. But then, you know, we talked about capital uh, on innovation. We're allocating that capital among those 20 business units, by the way, through a com our capital allocation committee, uh, you know, allocating that capital to the highest growth opportunities, highest impact opportunities from a patient perspective 
as well as a financial perspective. But then, you know, how, that's innovation. Now let's talk about how we allocate capital to shareholders. Um, you know, first our commitment to 50% of our free cash flow uh, to go to uh, back to shareholders. This is primarily through the dividend. Um, you know, we've been a dividend risk craft for you know 45 years, uh, and and tie that dividend. We try to grow it at the rate of earnings, uh, and just raise it another eight percent uh, in in 2022, and continue to raise it during COVID. I think in our FY21 it was like seven percent. FY22 it was like nine percent. You know, so we are uh, committed to this in good times and bad. Uh, and then finally on share buybacks, the focus is really covering dilution from stock-based compensation. So that is our allocation, and we're really trying to make sure we're balancing. Uh, that investment to, to innovation and back to shareholders. And then finally, our, our long-term financial plan, this is it, uh, you know, 5% top line growth, 8% bottom line growth with a healthy and growing dividend that gets you to a double digit, uh, you know, shareholder return. Uh, that's, a, that's the formula that we, uh, you know, that we are sticking with. And, um, you know, I want to end where I began uh, with, our, with our mission. Um, look, like I said before, this mission inspires us, it defines us, and it guides us. Our short-term decisions, and literally on a daily basis, as well as our long-term decisions that we're looking at every quarter, every year. Um, and it's a real strength and a real asset for the company uh, that we really saw, you know, uh, if there was any doubt of the leadership of the company, it really guided us during COVID, helped us to make decisions. Uh, that I think were the, were the right thing to do for our patients, our shareholders, our employees, all our stakeholders, including our shareholders. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really confident that this mission that's helped us not just survive for seven years, but for thrive, it is a, the key secret ingredient to this um, you know, value, you know, uh, superior value creation over time here. Uh, I wanna, again, thank you for your time. We've got a little bit of time for, for Q&A and I will turn it over to, I think Ryan, you're gonna be, uh, Take, okay, we got, I guess, questions coming in from the uh, online audience. Exactly. Okay, so on page four of your latest global inclusion report, you say that innovation comes from fostering an inclusive, diverse, and equitable workforce. If diversity is an innovation driver, why not raise and accelerate your 2026 diversity targets? Oh, okay. Well, uh, look, I, I'd say on those diversity targets, first of all, we spend a lot of time working on it, a lot of debate, right? It's tied to, and it's tied to compensation as well. Uh, and so they've got a lot, of, um, a lot of debate within the company. We benchmark these numbers off of, of you know, off the outside world. We are above the benchmarks. We put, uh, I think, a pretty good stretch over the next five years uh, into these goals. And we, like I said, we tied it to comp. Um, and, and, and I think the other thing we wanna guard against here is there are no shortcuts in this uh, when it comes to inclusion and diversity. You know, we are prioritizing uh, diverse career development, you know, all the way from the start. You know, we just launched uh, two years ago this program with the um, historically black colleges to bring in people at the, in that case, African, African Americans, uh, the a, a Latinx uh, engineering organization called SHIP to bring in uh, Latina, Latino, uh, engineers at scale. And then as you go up the company, and I can go on and on, those are two areas that we're particularly focused on from an ethnic perspective. Uh, we've created, you know, career tracks for engineers where you don't have to be a manager to keep rising up, really catered to, uh, you know, women and, 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 and men who want to take, you know, maternity or paternity leave, and, but an extended leave and come back to the company. Uh, so there's a lot of things, where there's no shortcuts. Uh, so when these people are prepared when they take these jobs uh, to succeed. Uh, and so I, I feel comfortable with them and, 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 and that's the process we went through. So I hope I answered the question there. And we are leading here and have been recognized as a leader in this area. Great, thank you. In the past, the company has highlighted its diversity networks and employee resource groups. Can you talk about these and how they help you achieve your ID and E goals? Well, look, it's a, first of all, the employee resource groups there's a lot of them, I, I, and, and uh, they're more, I'd say, organic and, and bottoms up, uh, and uh, it relies on the employees to get together and, and maintain that. But then for certain areas, we've created these structures uh, that are more top-down. They get a lot more senior leadership engagement and support. You can, you, look, we can't 
we, a company like Medtronic, you do almost anything, but you can't do everything. So we focused when it comes to inclusion, diversity, and equity on a couple of areas. We've got five such networks. Uh, you know, female is the biggest one, the women's network, uh, African descent, Asian, Latin, uh, and then finally LGBTQ, that's the latest one. Uh, I, think, I think I named all five. And these networks provide a community to basically, uh, and, and they're focused on three things. It's the, that community, but it's recruit, engage, develop. Uh, and they also, uh, we get together physically, uh, these once a year for the, the, the global or the national meetings, but there's regional meetings going on all the time and local meetings going on almost every day. Uh, as I travel around to our different sites, I speak to these groups, but it's about the community. It's about recruit, engage, develop. Uh, and we do part, and because of the scale of these networks, we're able to do partnerships with these different organizations. Like I mentioned, uh, the Thurgood Marshall College Fund and Historically Black Colleges, SHIP, uh, which is this Latin Latinx uh, engineering organization. I can go on and on and on. Uh, you know, because you have that scale and structure, we're able to do these partnerships and make these investments and track these investments to make sure we're getting the outcomes that we want. Uh, so these networks are critical. It's part of our culture now. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it, for me, I was the, the executive chair of the African Descent Network the last eight years before I became CEO. And by far and away is the area where I got the most, you know, leadership development uh, and, and um, you know, where I learned the most, if you, you know, and I think I've had the most impact, uh, you know, in, in my career. So really proud of that. And, and they continue to thrive at Medtronic. Got one more question for you. Your presentation showed some of your directors have been on your board for 10 plus years. There are some firms that believe that starts to challenge their independence. What value do you get from your experienced board members? I wish those firms could be in our board meeting. And I, and I get what they're saying. Uh, I can see the different dynamics in different boards, but those three directors are uh, uh, some of our, um, if I use the word, toughest ones in terms of, they, they remember the mistakes of the past and the cycles. Uh, and I think it's, it really, it, it depends on the person. And it's, it, a board has to self-police this, in my opinion. You know, our, those three directors, are, uh, you know, they have not lost their fastball to say the least. Uh, they have not lost their independence uh, and their familiarity with what we've tried and done over the past uh, is really serving them all in their, in their governance role. And it's just the opposite. And I understand how on the outside and it could, it could feel this way. And it really, you gotta get inside the boardroom, understand the dynamics, understand these individuals and how it, and in our case, these uh, individuals, quite frankly, are maybe the highest bar uh, that we have uh, to, to, to jump over when it comes to uh, governance because of their, you know, the, some of the, for lack of a better word, some of the learnings of the past, scars of the past. Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Thanks for, uh, I think, a very comprehensive, integrated and sustainable plan. I love this notion of perpetual value creation. It's not just a one-time hit, but how do you do that over time? And Medtronic has done that since its history. I also thought Jeff did a great job of tying today's current strategies with the mission, the original mission of the organization, how those connect up great. And good to see real progress on you know, efforts like the ESG goals and the progress on that. Innovation, uh, these little cams seem like such a cool idea for those who've gone through the colonoscopy approach. This sounds like a much better idea. Um, and uh, you really threw that and how this really connected to the organization and good answers to the question. So thanks for everybody from Medtronic. Uh, 